Dzień dobry, Gdańsk. Hi, my name is Robert. <laughs> Short presentation. My name is Robert, and um, I want to invite you with the story of how to make a submarine disappear. It all begins with a steel tube, about 80 meters long, 7 meters wide, about 2,000 tons. I mean, the obvious thing, if you want a submarine to disappear, to become invisible, is to just disappear visually. Dive, you are a submarine. Okay, if you do that, you will disappear from the surface. But the people looking for you, they are extremely persistent. They will stay in the same place, looking for you for days. You have to stay below the surface for weeks. To do that, you have to have something on board your submarine that can convert your fuel, your energy, into something else like energy or the way of energy that you need, air independent systems. And you actually have a vari variety of air independent systems. I mean, the biggest one is a nuclear power plant, but there are other ones, more simpler. The Stirling engine. This one is a Stirling engine. It is an invention that is about 100 years old, very simple. I'm actually propelling this out of a cup of hot water. But today, the Stirling engine of a submarine is, of course, very much more advanced and requires computer power. And the computer divides the energy this one can convert into three main streams. First, the energy that you have for electrical loads, and the main electrical load of a submarine is the propeller, the propeller motor. The second part is actually, as we use heat to start with, we create steam. And that steam is used to clean the air of the submarine. All submarines, like Dasbot, they had calcium powder. So you blow all your air through the calcium powder, and the carbon dioxide is consumed in that powder. But when that powder is completely full with carbon dioxide, you have to replace it. Take it out of the submarine, replace it. It's bulky, messy, heavy, and the powder can even go out into the submarine's atmosphere. Now, today, you use solid amino acid systems, same as the space station. It's a system that you can regenerate without replacing the content. So you blow the air through that one, and the carbon dioxide is taken out. But the beauty is, when it's full of carbon dioxide, you can regenerate it with steam. And that steam you get from the Stirling engine. The computer helps us, guiding how much we need. The third is actually heating the submarine itself. Because running a submarine in cold waters, like the Baltic, it's pretty cold down there. So you have to heat the submarine for the sailors to work. So now we have a submarine that can stay below the surface for weeks, without breaking the surface. Well, the people looking for us that I said was persistent, they are very persistent. If they cannot find you visually, they start to listen for you. So you have to be quiet. Water conducts sound amazingly. It's fast, and it goes very far. Especially in the Baltic, when you have salt layers, the sound can actually bounce like a laser beam between the salt layers and go insane distances. So how do you keep a submarine containing about 30 people, 100 various systems, and the combined computer power of our underground command and control center, how do you keep that quiet? Of course, you can install everything you put on board, should be quiet from the beginning, quiet computers, quiet pumps, and you tell the sailors, please be quiet. You can do that, and you do that, because it's, it's, it's a crime to make a noise on board a submarine. But where's the engineering in it? How do you keep a submarine quiet from an engineering point of view? I ask of you to imagine that you are sitting on a railway station. Do it, do it. You're on a railway station. You hear the train coming. Where do you hear the train coming? Where do you hear the sound of the train first? 
the tracks. That's where you have the train. Because sound travels so much faster in metal than compared to air. That's the same thing with water. The sound travels so fast in, air, in water compared to air. So now imagine that train traveling on the tracks with the steel wheels, transmitting all the vibrations down into rails. Take that steel wheel and replace it with a rubber wheel. Total silence. You isolate the train from the tracks. That's what you do with the submarine. You actually build the entire submarine, the inner structures of the submarine, everything on platforms. And then you slide it in the hull and you mount it on rubber mounts everywhere. No contact to the hull without the rubber mounts. And you can take it even a step further. Today, with the amazing computer power you have today in the modeling, you can do something called double elastic mounting. You take your components with a rubber mount, and then you have a floating floor or a counterweight, and below that, you have rubber again. And then you have your platform. Then you have a double elastic system. And if you tune it correctly, and this is only basically possible with modern computer models, you can actually make it cancel out totally. This is just as your sound cancelling earphones. You create sound that is opposite to the sound that you would like to avoid. This is the equivalent of sound, sound blocking, but mechanical version of it. OK, so now we have a submarine that can stay down for weeks, and it is silent. See if you can get the next picture going. Oops, sorry. Back up again. Yep. Can you run it, please? With sound. Where's the sound? There's a submarine in there somewhere. You are one of the few that have actually heard how it sounds, other than on the movie Das Boot. This is what we do to the submarines with underwater explosions. We always insist the project manager to be on board with the first blast. Um, but um, to be able to design something that can endure those kind of levels, and I can't even speak about the levels here on stage, is that you use finite element uh, modeling, of course, but you do insane level of simulation and calculations. You even simulate the underwater detonation itself. It takes hours and hours just to run one lap of one single explosion. Then you have a design and you think, OK, I'm done. Now I have a design, I've modeled it, everything is beautiful. No, you cannot stop there. What you do is that you build the actual hull in scale one to three and you put it in a gigantic pressure chamber. You put sensors all along the hull, and you have computer systems and software monitoring 100 times a second what is happening to the hull. And then you pressurize the hull and see what happens. And if the real life measurements do not correlate to your calculations and models what should happen, back to the drawing board. You need to have a model that is so accurate that you can predict exactly what's going to happen. OK, so we have a submarine that can withstand shock. Now, what material do you use? There are many things. I mean, the first submarine was actually made out of wood, but I wouldn't recommend that. It's actually steel in the most of cases. And if you have the requirement that the hull should actually live and protect your crew for about 40, 50 years with exposure like this, you often end up in steel, super hard steel with some secret recipe, but steel that can attract Earth's magnetic fields. 
So when the sub goes through the earth magnetic field, it actually attracts the lines a bit. How do you counteract this? Because this can be detected from the surface. You put windings inside the submarine in all orthogonal directions. And then, of course, you have another amazing computer system that brings in the position of the submarine, the heading, the speed, the roll, the trim, the Earth magnetic field outside of the sub. And it calculates exactly how much current each coil should have and gently pushes out the Earth magnetic field lines again. So you become invisible for the sensors. <coughs> Where's my recipe how to, how to make a submarine disappear? Here it is. So are we done? No, not really. I mean, those three I've mentioned now, stay, stay dive, um, be acoustically gone and magnetically gone. But that's only a fraction of what you have looked at. You have small fields on board the submarine, galvanic corrosion. You have pressure waves in front of the submarine. You create just due to the fact that it's moving through water. You have vortices behind the propeller. What you have to do is you have to start from zero hertz to infinity, or let's say gigahertz, and look at every frequency spectrum that you can possibly think of. Magnetic, electric, acoustic, physical, light, heat, everything. You do not want to have spikes in the frequency spectrum. Then you create what is actually called signature. And you do not want to have a signature of your submarine. So the perfect signature of a submarine is a flat line. And where's the future going? I mean, we've heard several speakers here today, artificial intelligence. Decision support systems. Let's say you have 20 alarms going off at the same time. Which alarm should I look at? You have computers now that can recommend you look at this alarm first, this one, and then this one. And what is the root cause of everything? Data fusion. Let's say that you ask your computer to collect all the data that it can do inside the submarine. All of a sudden, you can get a message from the computer. Look at pump number 53. The bearing needs replacement in two weeks. You can do that. You have to be creative in your thinking. What can I apply my new thinking on? <clears throat> so, now we've done everything we can to stay invisible. But we have to operate it as well when we are invisible. And the perfect place to listen for something is on board the submarine, because the submarine is so quiet. So you turn the entire submarine into one gigantic microphone. You place microphones on the left side, on the right side, on the front of the submarine, 360 degrees around the submarine. You even tow a line 100 meters long with microphones on the line. It's called towed array. Why do we need so many microphones? We want to listen for very low frequencies. Low frequencies have very long wavelengths. We need separation. We also want to know where the sound is coming from. That's why we need separation again. Each microphone, or in the water it's called hydrophone, has an AD converter, analog to digital converter, and it converts as soon as it can to get the signal-noise ratio as high as it can. Sorry, I'm nerding out here. I love engineering. And then it sends data packs to real-time signal processors. And here is an amazing computer system on board. It's called the sonar system. It takes all these sounds and analyzes, yep, here we have a contact. So a contact appears on the screen. And the sonar operator presses on that screen and what happens next is truly amazing. I'm fortunate enough to actually have been on a submarine and experienced it. With your earphones, you're warped to that location. You hear the propeller in the water as if you were standing right next to it. You hear the engine. I promise you, if you are listening to a 
cruise ship, you hear the music in the nightclub. And of course, the computer recognizes, has sound processes and recognizes patterns, just as Siri on our iPhones, or Alexa, or what they're called. It proposes to me what kind of propeller I'm, looking, I'm listening to. How many revolutions per minute? What ship is it? I'm not really sure it will recommend or tell me what kind of music they played in the nightclub, but who knows, they might, might do someday. Another amazing computer-aided tool we have today, compared to before, is the optics. Remember, again, the famous Dustbot movie? You have a periscope, and you have red lighting, you have dark adaptation with your eyes. That's old school. Today, you have cameras. You actually put your camera on long rod in a mast outside of the pressure hull, peek out and pull back. A quick picture. And then you analyze it calmly in your control room. No risk for exposure, because it's a very short exposure. And the computer, again, even suggests to you what you are looking at. That had never been possible without someone programming voice recognition or pattern recognition software. But honestly, if we take all these amazing computers we have, all technology, and compare it to Mother Nature, we are quite bad. We have a long way to go. There is someone out there who is a gold champion in sound processing, using two sensors, one here, one there, and one brain, is a dolphin. The, what the dolphin does in acoustic recognition is mind-blowing. And we actually work together with dolphins. That's the out-of-the-box thinking you have to do. We actually try to design things that dolphins have a hard time identifying. So if you can build, if you can design and build a fish, a 2,000 ton steel fish that even dolphins cannot recognize, I would say that then you belong to the people with a mindset who actually can see what most people would see, say. It's invisible. There's nothing here. But you guys, you can. You can create something from the invisible. So keep on creating. Cinco Barso.